All right, so we heard some <coughs> stories about digital twins, and now we're going to go a little bit more in depth in some of these questions. And I have a fantastic panel here. Um, my name is Eric Dermans. I'm the director uh, for research computing within UFIT. And my team manages Hypergator, University of Florida's supercomputer, which is the biggest academic university owned and operated supercomputer in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so we're proud of that, and Hypergator is, 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 a, is our secret weapon. <coughs> I also have here uh, Zoe Ryan. Uh, he's, she is a solutions architect at NVIDIA. She has been working with NVIDIA for a number of years and has been giving lots of training sessions and has worked with us on these projects that you heard about earlier this morning. And she is uh, our secret weapon to try and get these digital twins to work. And digital twin, uh, we will talk about it, it's, it's really bleeding edge technology. Right? There are some things that are, you know, the visualization part, people have seen nice visual images of, of buildings and all kinds of things. But the digital twin puts some extra secret sauce in there that makes it really bleeding art. And then I also have Ying Zhang, who is the IT manager in UFIT research uh, computing for our AI initiatives. So if you are working, thinking about anything that has to do with AI, then you will work with her and her team, and they will help you navigate uh, how you can get started with the project. What do you need to learn? What, what do you need to have as resources? And uh, since we are talking about technical support, I also want to shout out to our team, uh, Matt Gitzendunner and his training, and Dan Maxwell and Ian Lutiken. They are also part of Research Computing, and you will also work with them. And uh, I also want to call out our newest Jian Zhao, who was just hired and is now part of our consultant team. So you may actually reach out to her. I also want to call out Caleb Smith from <laughs> NVIDIA. And he is our prime contact. Uh, you may have heard of NVAITC, the NVIDIA AI Technology Center. And they sponsor a lot of the research activities that we have at the University of Florida. And Caleb is our uh, go-to person to, to establish that contact. So what you, the way we see Caleb is that if we have any really complicated question, he is the gateway to the very large resources that NVIDIA has. And, and you know, find the right person to help us out. So that means that when we say we're going to build a digital twin or anything other complicated, really future thing, like uh, the things you heard earlier this morning. We have a very strong partner in NVIDIA helping us, and you know, they're not kidding. It's, it's tough, and it doesn't go very easy all the time, but they're, they're with us. <coughs> so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get started. And the first question is to Zoe. Can you start by explaining to our audience what is a digital twin as it is used today? And then maybe you know describe some some use cases of how it works. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you for having me here today. I'm gonna take this out actually. Um, so we've gotten the pleasure to see quite a few great examples of digital twins this morning already. But I'm gonna re-explain, even if it's a little redundant. I hope you'll forgive me. But when we're talking about digital twins, what we're really talking about is a digital representation of some type of physical asset. So we've seen really good examples already today of the ICU room, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a building. I think one thing that we've seen come out of uh, university engagement and research is that digital twins can be more than a building. It could be, for example, um, in an agricultural space, it could be a farm, um, it could be a cell, it could be a fusion reactor. So um, I think we can expand our idea. It could be Florida. We saw that already too. So what we're really talking about um, is any kind of digital representation of something that exists in our physical world. And we heard some really good examples of some key components, like what makes a digital twin, 
more than just the CAD model that we already have. We talked about having it be live and synchronous with some existing sensors in our real world. That's a really important piece if we plan to make decisions based off our digital twins. We want to make sure it's synchronized and up to date. And along with that goes um, that a digital twin should be kind of our single source of truth for all of our 3D data or virtual data that we have. So we'll see a lot throughout this panel and throughout today that there's all different types of 3D data that we're able to bring together in a digital twin. And what it really offers us is that single source of truth. One last piece that kind of separates a digital twin maybe from more of like a video game environment is the focus on the um, reality of the physics, making sure that things interact in your digital world as they would in the physical world. And that's been a really big piece and oftentimes a struggle with some of these digital twin projects is making sure that everything that's happening in your virtual simulation in your digital twin really represents what it would happen in the real world. So those are kind of some like high level components we're looking for in a digital twin. The focus being on real time, connected to your real world, and a true representation of your physical asset. And to go on to like some examples, we saw three great examples today already, but um, from the NVIDIA side, we've seen some other types of partnerships as well. So one kind of long-term goal would be to do some forward-looking climate simulations on the entire world's surface or Earth's surface, so you can use not only climate data, but the 3D data we have about the world's kind of topography in order to make predictions on climate change. So that's a great, that's a pipe dream, you know, what can we do with digital twins at the largest scale? But we can also scale it down to maybe more of like a laboratory size, right? If we're working, for example, with a fusion reactor that we already have CAD models of, we already do a lot of simulations of, one kind of important piece that we could do is do better predictive maintenance by having a digital twin of that fusion reactor. It's obviously a very finicky piece of machinery, something that's tricky to do maintenance on, and if you have a digital twin, then what you're able to do is predict failures in the future, try out things that might be dangerous to try out in the real world, um, and have that all as part of an integrated simulation between your actual fusion reactor and something that exists kind of in our virtual world. So, those are kind of two different scales of projects we can imagine. And it's always nice to bring it back to what we might think of as like a traditional digital twin. I think we often think of maybe a factory floor. It feels like a very natural uh, use case for digital twins. Factory planning costs a lot of money, costs a lot of human hours as well, um, and can be a really big blocker for many businesses. And having a digital twin of a factory where you can not only try different layouts, um, see visualizations of whatever you're moving, um, can be really impactful on your business use case as well. So. It really does span the whole kind of stretch of use cases that we could consider. And I think universities are actually um, well suited to have more of our interesting use cases, right? How does this become a cross-disciplinary thing when we're talking about digital twins? So I hope it's not too repetitive, but that's kind of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about what digital twins are. Wonderful, thank you. So Ying, uh, <clears throat> your, a question to you. Can you briefly summarize how UFIT research computing supports the AI activities at UF, how does it work? Uh, how do we support the teaching for research? And then how do we plan to support digital twins that are now on, on the top of everybody's mind? Uh, yeah, you hear me right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, as Erica just uh, introduced, so we are uh, at the research computing. We are a service provider providing computing resources to the entire UF campus, of course, beyond UF actually at this point. Um, so specifically for AI support for our uh, research computing, we focus on three areas. So I give a brief introduction on our uh, services for uh, three, like uh, first of all, we are providing computing resources, including hardware and software. And then second, we provide uh, compu uh, AI consultation uh, to all our, uh, of our UF researchers and research groups. And also third, of, all, of course, AI education and AI training. Both, um, uh, all this applies mostly for research. Of course, we have a teaching support as well. For the computing resource, hardware and the software, that really provides to all the research groups and the teaching. And for, uh, so you know Hypergator and how, and the Hypergator AI, which is the world's most powerful AI system. And um, so for research, you can get allocation on Hypergator by purchasing uh, allocations or if you're a new user uh, research group, you can get a, a three months free trial and just submit a ticket, fill out a form, uh, we'll get you started. Uh, for teaching, the location is free. It's also simply just by submitting a ticket, we'll get you set up. 
Um, for the software resource, we have a whole stack, very robust stack of software, uh, AI software uh, installed on Hypergator. Pretty much all you need uh, is there. And of course, if you have uh, extra software, we are happy to install for you uh, for free, mostly if it's uh, not licensed software. Uh, for consultation service, uh, we provide, so as Eric just introduced, we have a um, team of AI consultants. So we currently have five, including myself. Then we are have a, we'll have a new member join in November. So we provide AI consultation service uh, at the different levels uh, from uh, simple, basic AI consultation free of charge. For example, install software, uh, questions on how to use the software on Hypergator, how to uh, run your wor uh, workflows on Hypergator, uh, all the way to deeply involved with your <coughs> project. Uh, you can use our paid consulting service, uh, hire us uh, to design your workflow, uh, writing software packages for your research, and uh, all the deep involvement. So just talk to us, uh, uh, tell us what you need. Um, so that's consulting service, and we also, of course, we have uh, our uh, NVIDIA partners here. <laughs> if uh, things we cannot resolve, we can always ask our experts at uh, NVIDIA, so including Zoe too. Um, so on the AI training side, we have an AI training team led by Matt, is, who is here, uh, and his team is here too. We provide uh, trainings from basic beginner uh, tra AI training uh, all the way to advanced um, AI training on diff uh, in different AI domains. So we also partner with our NVIDIA AI Tech Center, provide the NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute workshops. Uh, in fact, uh, this Friday we have one on uh, generative uh, computer vision Zoe so will be the uh, instructor and the teacher uh, lead that Friday workshop. I uh, invite you to all sign up if you want to know uh, using Omniverse to do, uh, to do digital twins to generate uh, digital contents. So that would be a fantastic workshop. Um, and um, so that's pretty much the AI service we provide for all UF communities, uh, including faculty, students, and the staff. Uh, in terms of the digital twin, uh, yeah, you all talked, our for previous session talked about a lot of digital twin uh, use cases, so we also talked about uh, a little bit, and uh, we also have other in IFAS, in engineering, there are lots of projects uh, going on in terms of digital twins. So, um, and uh, how to get started on the digital twin? Uh, is that the, also the second question? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, okay, I can. We just, can we just re it. reach out. Actually, my, my next question is for Zoe is uh, can you describe at a high level what it takes to make a digital twin? Yeah, it's a, a loaded question, but we can talk a little bit about at least first steps. Um, we've seen this across the U.F. and also I work with universities across uh, the United States and we've actually come across like a couple good questions for getting started. I think most important, especially after a day like this when all the buzz is going to be about digital twins, is the first question is uh, what do you want to accomplish with a digital twin that you can't already do with your physical system? Because I think sometimes the answer is not a digital twin. Oftentimes it's these sensors do really well. We're already getting the information we need. And adding in this massive amount of work is not necessarily going to bring us new data or new information that we can't get elsewhere. So kind of the grounding point that we always come back to is outside of it being very cool to work on digital twins, what are you literally going to gain from having this digital twin asset that you can't get from another form? And that's always kind of step one. We get on a call and we discuss kind of setting boundaries or expectations around the digital twin first. Um, and I think that can be a great starting point. And that often leads to discussions on the type of data that you already have. Um, from the discussions we already had this morning and from kind of maybe your own thoughts on digital twin potential, the thing that can be the hardest to do and also take the most time is data aggregation and getting together 
either data you already have, which is uh, in our best case you have data that we can use, or finding ways to create or generate or find more data. So kind of step one after you've come to terms with what your digital twin will be used for, hopefully you've set up some terms for success or some qualifiers for success. That can be another hard thing on a long project like a digital twin, but having concrete goals that can be like step one would be a great full fidelity visualization, something that looks great, something that looks like the ICU room is a great um, short-term-ish goal to have and then going about actually working with your data. So a big thing about digital twins and something that um, the NVIDIA team and the Mark III team do a lot of time uh, working on is bringing together kind of independent data silos into one kind of unified digital twin. Oftentimes a digital twin is really just a culmination of data that you already have in some other format and bringing it together in a real-time visualized manner can be really powerful. So getting all that data, having a place to store it, um, having it all work in the same kind of uh, contiguous space is really step one. And so after those two steps, things get more exciting, right? Uh, you have a concrete plan, you have data, and now it's all about the first steps of iterating on your process and really building a team. I think um, UF has done a really good job of explaining how cross-discipline this project can be. Um, the Digital Twin of Florida, I would really kind of highlight that at the highest level. You're going to have people from virtually, it seems like, every school here at University of Florida. But even on a smaller project, um, this can't be accomplished by a team of one domain scientist, right? So in the fusion reactor example, we're not going to have a physicist go out there and build a whole digital twin. It's going to take a team of technical 3D artists, um, maybe industrial designers, someone who can program, so a software engineer, a software developer, a DevOps team to get you set up on the right hardware and software, uh, someone who's going to plan this. I think oftentimes we're um, missing out on the key component of someone who's got um, a good idea of project management or project-based skills. And then maybe you have your domain scientists or your simulation engineer or your roboticist. So we're talking on the order of like five to ten people at least who are experts in their field to come together and bring their skills together into a digital twin. And I think um, we've done a really good job highlighting that today, but it oftentimes is overlooked as maybe the most pivotal component of building a digital twin is having the right team set up um, to meet those different areas or levels of success. So step one, figure out if it really makes sense to do a digital twin. Step two, find some data and hope it's good data. Uh, and step three, uh, build the right team. And I think that in a university setting, everyone's really well equipped to do that. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of success building awesome teams who can bring their most important skills to the table um, to build a digital twin. So long-winded, we've gotten through three steps um, of getting towards hopefully what would be the first step at a digital twin. And we've seen that across many different groups here um, in the tech center, but also just across UF. Yeah, that is, that's wonderful. That's a nice uh, overview. So I would now ask the audience, do any of you, after what you just heard, have any particular questions to steer the, the rest of the conversation and the panel? Like, do you have any particular questions? I see. Hold on. Um, in different AI fields, you know, there's like different getting started or canonical examples like machine learning, there's the MNIST digit data set for digital twins is what's like the here, get started today project, like the beginner. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, from the NVIDIA perspective, uh, we have actually just recently put out some getting started material. I think that's been a really common question for our specific platform Omniverse, but what I always guide uh, folks who are starting a new project to do is Hopefully they have some sort of data. So if we're working with an architecture school, they have maybe like some CAD data or engineering school. And our first step would be install Omniverse and see if you can bring your 3D data into the platform, right? Visualize into a different, or bring your data from one source into another and see if you can visualize it in the same way. That's a really good starting point. And then you can continue to bring in other data. But if we're gonna talk also just kind of literally what your first steps could be, there is online content for getting started with Omniverse in general. Um, which would be a great foundation for starting your digital twin project so that you have videos, DLIs, you could come to my DLI on Friday as a shameless plug, that'd be a great getting started um, for you. But yeah, that's a great question. I don't think we have such a canonical example yet, but i um, definitely working on like at least getting started materials um, for your individual use case. And also there's a good community of uh, Omniverse YouTube videos, which sounds kind of lame, but it also has great introduction tutorials and materials for um, getting started with digital twins. So. Questions? Other questions? Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Is that compared to other 
uh, build these things methods like uh, building things in Unity engineer, uh, engine and the Unreal Engine, what's the benefit of digital twin? And can we um, get interaction with the data within the digital twin? And uh, in other words, can we merge the immersive technology like uh, VR or AR with the digital twin? Thank you. Yeah, these are really good questions. So I think this was touched on a little bit in the previous session, but a goal with a digital twin is not to leave behind all the valuable simulation and 3D data that you've done in the past or are doing now, but instead bring it together into kind of one cohesive place where you can interact with the data. So you use the example of Unity or um, like Blender or Houdini. Um, we're not, especially with the Omniverse platform, the goal is not to leave that behind, but instead bring data from all those different sources into one kind of location in one format where you can use it together. I feel like the 3D world or 3D graphics in general have been fairly disjoint. Um, and a digital twins focus is really just to make those cohesive and have them be interactive in one single platform. And then your next question, which leads into that, so now we have our digital twin, like how do we interact with it? What do we literally do with it? One thing you can do is just view it as you would in your normal kind of browser or application. And then there's a great demo next door showing exactly what you mentioned around using VR. I think that's been really popular for, um, especially on the university setting, like, oh, I wanna make a digital twin of a building. How can I put this in a center to have students walk through it with VR? And that's been definitely something that Omniverse is working on integrating. You can walk through the hospital room um, and actually interact and see what the space looks like. And especially if we're talking about um, like Carla's project where she's talking about planning and building new buildings, it'd be really important to be immersed in that space, not looking at it on a screen. So VR will be a big piece of that, um, whether it's a digital twin of a building or something small, like maybe you wanna interact with like a molecule and have it actually be in front of you. Um, VR is an important piece or AR, just different types of XR experiences and that's definitely something that's integrated in digital twin platforms that exist today. So a really good question. Um, I think it makes it much easier to interact with 3D data when you're actually like in the physical space instead of looking at it on a screen, so. Yeah, also Omniverse should not be thought of as a single monolithic application. It is more like a graphical programming environment where you al are allowed and able to put multiple components together. So you, you will have your digital twin and then, for instance, if it's a building and you're looking at the air handler, the air handler has a motor and the motor moves some air, well, you can include the physical simulation of a motor in there so that when you accelerate the motor, it does a physically realistic rendering of how the air flows, flows faster. And then you can do some fluid dynamics in the pipes and all of that can be get, gotten together rather than having some parameterization where you say, typically if I accelerate my motor to run twice as fast, then the flow of the air will be double and you have some simple model, but that's not the true value of, of a digital twin. You wanna go deeper and have more detailed. And then if there are, so that's how you will plug in all these other applications, the physical simulation, data streams from sensors, other pieces of software that people have developed, they can all be connected and, and you can then have this fully uh, integrated experience. Other questions? Yeah, Jim. So I thought it was really important that you said that, you know, the digital twins are not the solution to everything. Um, in ex my previous experience, a lot of, it takes a lot of effort to build an effective one that actually gives reliable output. It made more sense to say when I'm building, designing a new building that I'm gonna do it at the very beginning because you're thinking about the data collection from the, from the moment that you're thinking about the project. Do you have some rule of thumbs given what you said about it, about like how much um, benefit you should expect back relative to when I should do a digital twin versus a traditional project? Yeah, that's a really good and tough question. I think, uh, especially from the NVIDIA perspective, I've been helping with digital twins maybe the last year or so. And I think at this point, what we're doing is trying to do a lot of catch up uh, on existing systems, kind of retrofit them with digital twins. But I think even with what we saw today around Carla's discussion for how do we prepare all the buildings on University of Florida's campus to have digital twins from the onset is really where we should be looking towards. 
Um, I think if you were to ask the Mark III or NVIDIA team, a lot of times it's chasing down data that maybe doesn't exist or isn't in the right format and can waste a lot of time on the, da the data aggregation side. Um, and that can, I think it's often uh, maybe one of the biggest bottlenecks for getting started with these projects. So I think unfortunately we're in a little bit of a cycle of playing catch up, right? Making good digital twins now that are worthwhile to use is gonna take more time when you have to maybe retrofit or kind of mash together pieces that weren't custom built or process built for this. But going forward, I think one thing that we've seen and one thing that's been a focus from the NVIDIA perspective is a unified format for 3D data. So um, if, if you've heard of it, we utilize something called USD or Universal Scene Description, which actually came out of Pixar. So it's an open source 3D format for building 3D worlds. And so we're putting a lot of focus and effort into getting data that already exists into that USD format. So we have connectors that go from any application and get your data into that format. But going forward, you could see it might be advantageous to start with that format, right? Kind of escape that bottleneck, have something that's unified and can be built upon each other. Like my little teapot's already in USD and my room is USD. So that's a really great place to start. So while I think we're in that cycle of playing catch up and getting things more unified, going forward, it's definitely a focus on a platform that is extensible and um, can use data from all different sources, but hopefully with less like fric friction or tension on the process. So. It's definitely something that we're working through on multiple different projects. Um, I think from the robotics side, there's a nice thing where there is more of a standardization across formats for robots, uh, like virtualized robots. Um, and we've seen maybe a little bit more ease in getting into the um, robotics piece because there has been a more consistent foundation built on how we actually collect data. Um, so I think that's kind of something to aspire towards for things that are not necessarily robotics focused, but is definitely a big work in progress. Right. Another another way to think of digital twins is that the, the the real important value that you can get from modern digital twins as opposed to the three-dimensional copies in video games or in Second Life of, of a decade ago is that you can incorporate the output from all kinds of decision systems that are based on physical modeling and simulation and also on AI. But what is a big challenge for these things, especially when you start to look at complex systems and how they interact, to present the data is very complex and, and to, to share data in the form of engineering diagrams or spreadsheets or, or graphs is not that good but we as humans are very good at getting information out of a visual world and so the digital twin gives you the ability to collect all these streams of data all these pieces of knowledge and put them in one coherent environment where you can then look around and, and g look at those details that you are interested in and it'll help you, even if you are the engineer building the digital twin and you understand all the things that's going on, if you need to go to your administration or to legislators like Christine was saying, and you have to communicate, well, what is the effect going to be of all these complicated factors, then the digital twin will help that communication part. <clears throat> Because we are consultant team, so we have a lot of PIs contact us to present a different um, use case for digital twins. I think from practical point of view, so uh, think about when to start consider use digital twin. I think it's really very case by case. It depends on your usage, on your future potential usage as well, on the scale. Uh, so. No, I, I'm, I'm fine. I think. Yes, <laughs> that, that works. Um, I think to adopt a digital twin, definitely there's the initial learning curve. That's definitely, there, there is a step there. But once you get used to it, you accumulate created uh, digital assets. Uh, although right now, really, there are lots of, for example, Omniverse already have uh, existing made uh, digital assets, of course, for your use case. You can make your own digital assets. And once you get all the pieces together and you can simulate, and that will take a little bit long time, but I think 
in the end, it really depends what you want to do. So Eric just talked about the advantage of using digital twin and also there's also some other advantages like it's really costly to simulate a real, uh, to just replicate in physical term, for example, food storage. So we have IFAS project uh, to want to build a digital twin for food uh, storage. Uh, using what, what's the, on the temperature control, on the moisture control, you do not want to build a physical food storage just do the experiments. Instead, you build a digital twin. That's a lot of uh, cost cutting, right? It's much uh, economically uh, makes sense. So you build a digital twin, you have the sensors, data, uh, moisture data, temperature data, how to control uh, on the, uh, for the different uh, type of foods, vegetables, meats, all that stuff. So you can simulate on, in that way and then you can how to arrange your food items in your food storage to optimize the energy use. So that's also consideration as well. All right, great, great panel. So high level question. I'm a researcher at the University of Florida. I really want to do a digital twin. Do I need to go out and buy my own workstation to do a digital twin? Or are there hypergator resources, maybe hardware, things you're going to do in the future? where I can utilize Hypergator in your services? Spot on, <laughs> Caleb, yes, that's a great <laughs> question. I think probably that's a question most of people here want to ask. So yes, actually the simple answer is, first of all, do you have a Hypergator account? If not, yeah. get a Hypergator account. <laughs> so uh, of course, first of, first of all, just contact us, get an account. If you, do not have Hypergator allocation, get a Hypergator allocation. So for the minimum to start with a digital twin, I think start with, for example, three or four CPU cores, at least the one GPU. So um, at this point, I have to say that uh, our, yes, I forgot to answer your question, like what's the digital twin uh, resource on Hypergator? So we do have, at this point, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, RTX GPUs. We have five uh, RTX GPU nodes on Hypergator and uh, with eight uh, RTX cards on each node. Um, so we have our test, so our digital twin environment is still in the testing stage. However, that doesn't prevent you to install your own Omniverse launcher client on Hypergator. So basically you can go to uh, NVIDIA website, download, I know NVIDIA uh, Omniverse environment has uh, two versions. One is the workstation version, one is the uh, standard version, one is the enterprise version. So we have enterprise version at research computing. Uh, however, since we are still in the testing stage, but you could download a standard uh, Omniverse uh, launcher. And then, uh, uh, of course, trans uh, download it to your Hypergator uh, uh, homes, uh, like your, your air working area. And you launch the Omniverse, then with the Omniverse launcher, you can install all the Omniverse applications. So, and you can just uh, start uh, experimenting uh, di different, for example, Omniverse Composer, Creator, uh, View, and the Code, uh, all the uh, Omniverse building applications. You can also install third party uh, applications. The, I have to, be, uh, the, the thing is, since research, uh, Hypergator is a Linux system, so the, at this point, there are very limited support for the third party uh, content creator, for example, Unity, Maya, Blender, all those software Unreal. So we do, um, at this point, we do have Unreal uh, plugin building uh, on the Hypergator open on demand. You can use that as a standalone um, application, but within the Omniverse, you can definitely use Omniverse uh, building applications to build, uh, create digital assets at this point. So 
feel free to contact us. Actually, in fact, for Friday's workshop, after Zoe's DOI workshop, we also are one of our team members will show you how to use Omniverse on Hypergator, uh, a demo a presentation. So uh, I remember someone asked the, the question, how to start use uh, Omniverse? Yes, come to our workshop. We'll have uh, uh, our people there to show you how to start Omniverse on Hypergator. So we also <coughs> ordered hardware to fully support Omniverse, and that is being delivered, and we think that that will become in production sometime in the spring. So in, in uh, February, March time frame, we hope that that will become production. So then we'll have the full hardware support for running Omniverse uh, applications in Hypergator. Yeah, for that system, uh, we'll have the latest uh, um, uh, RTX generation L40 uh, GPUs. So that would be most advanced uh, architecture. So we'll have, what's that, uh, eight nodes? I don't know about that. Uh, actually, I have the number here. So we'll have, um, yes, we'll have eight uh, L40 node. Uh, each node will have four uh, L40 GPUs. So th those will be most advanced Omniverse systems. So by spring, we'll build a production uh, Omniverse system with Enterprise Omniverse. So by that time, the Enterprise Omniverse, the advantage, of course, is that we can <laughs> correct me. Uh, so that will allow group collaborations. If you, can, you have uh, collaborators, different teams to work on the same project, the, that will allow you to work together even uh, for your external um, collaborators to work in the same Omniverse environment, and you can use a third party um, <coughs> content creator software as well. So that will be very uh, nice system set up by Spring. Thank you. And then I got another question for Zoe. So, so Zoe, I hear this word Omniverse all the time, and I'm, I'm just kind of like vague on what it is. So how does Omniverse differ from things like Blender and Unreal? And if I have a project in Blender, do I have to learn a whole new language and put it in Omniverse? That's a great question, Caleb. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we're talking about Omniverse, just to take a step back, um, what it really is is software provided by NVIDIA that's acting as a platform for developers to create digital twins. So it's in no, by no means is it replacing other 3D content creation applications like Blender, Maya, 3ds Max, CAD applications. What its goal really is, is to provide developers and researchers an opportunity to bring together data from those existing applications. So if you're working in Blender, you're a longtime Blender user, um, but you already also have data maybe from a CAD application, and you're like, I'm wondering how I could bring these two together. What we provide from Omniverse are these things that we call connectors. There's over like 60 or something connectors to existing applications. What it does is it takes your data from Blender, from your CAD application, from Paraview, from all these different applications, converts it to that common format that Omniverse understands, which is USD, and brings it into one kind of application. So Omniverse is really a bunch of different microservices that you can have access to as a developer to bring your data in, uh, collaborate on your data, and also write custom Python scripts that can do or modify things within your ecosystem. So that's why it's important to have a software developer engineer on your team who can take advantage of those tools. But it really is just offering a centralized location for you to store and work on your data across different teams, bring in um, information from various different ap applications you're already using, and then kind of run your overall simulation into one ecosystem. So Omniverse is not replacing your tools. In fact, it's just trying to bring them together. Keep working with what you're comfortable with, right? Like if you're a longtime Maya user and you have a lot of data there, continue to work there. And when you're ready to bring it into a digital twin ecosystem or with other data, then you can consider trying out Omniverse. Um, your skill sets are not going to be wasted by trying Omniverse. In fact, if you're already really comfortable using other 3D applications, you're going to be really well suited um, to try out the Omniverse ecosystem. So again, it's more of a platform for developers to bring together different ecosystems, different data types into one cohesive environment in a way that prior to Omniverse was fairly tricky because each of these are independent software kind of vendors who are not necessarily focused on bringing together the data types. So. That's the overall goal, collaboration, making digital twins easier to work on, and not wasting any of the data that you already have or any of the work you've already done in these other locations. Yeah, I also would like to add that 
uh, I said that uh, Hypergate is a Linux system, so at this point, uh, uh, due to the restrictions of Omniverse uh, system right now, because Omniverse is also quite a new uh, product too, so um, some connectors actually will not work on Linux system. Uh, so if you have already built, for example, on your workstation, use Maya, Blender, uh, build the already digital twin or digital contents, you can save it as a USD format and uh, transfer it to Hypergator and Omdurus will uh, can do the rendering with with no issue. So with uh, our fabulous GPUs, so very high quality rendering. So yes, that still can work. <laughs> 